Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Brain Scratch. I'm John Lorden, your host. Hope you've all had an awesome week and thank you so much for joining me here today. Today we're going to talk about Alien Stories and Travis Walton. But before we get to Travis, um, I want to rewind the clock a little bit. Uh, we're going back a year. Brain Scratch had just started and I was starting to get communication from people about potential story ideas. One Brain Scratcher was reaching out to me about this man named Corey Good. And Corey has, um, he claims to have a wealth of knowledge about what's going on in terms of aliens and how they're interacting on our planet. Uh, he claims that he was part of a program, put into the program very young, I believe at the age of 12. And if I recall correctly, he was gone for several years um, on interplanetary travels, including visiting bases on the moon where he would regularly interact with other types of beings. And this is a picture of Corey here from the SphereBeingAlliance.com website and behind him is what he calls a blue avian. So if you've heard anything about blue avians, um, I don't know if he came up with it on his own, but he's definitely a big proponent of them as an alien species. And there you can see a picture of them. Now, being myself, you guys know, I went into that with an open mind. Um, Corey was interviewed by someone else and it, I don't know if they started a channel or um, if they went to an existing channel that kind of covered paranormal stuff like that but I watched a lot I mean many hours of their interviews and it was really tough for me to believe the stories um, essentially Corey was lacking detail in a lot of areas. You never heard too much about specifics, like what these types of crafts look like. Um, and the details you did hear seemed strikingly familiar to known science fiction properties, specifically Star Trek. Um, at one point, if I recall correctly, he even described a replicator, and the way he talked about it was that it looked like a microwave, it made a ding noise when something was done, you would have to put your cup or your plate into it, and then you would pull it out and the food would be there. Um, it coincided exactly with how that device was seen on Star Trek. As a matter of fact, in their interviews, they frequently reference openly um, Star Trek and Stargate and a lot of other sci-fi properties. And his story to me just sounded like, it sounded kind of immature, like a childhood fantasy of uh, someone that was in love with that movie Flight of the Navigator. And if you just fuse that with Star Wars and Star Trek, um, that was about it. I didn't hear any compelling information, uh, definitely nothing close to proof or any type of independent sources. He has a couple of reoccurring characters in his stories. Um, one that, quite honestly, when I listen to any of his dialogue now, every time the name comes up, my, I have a physiological reaction where my eyes roll into my head. Like, I go, oh, God. <laughs> I, I can't even control it. And I'm trying to be open-minded to this guy's material. But quite honestly, it just seems so weak. Um, and outside of that, the person that was contacting me was looking to me to help them kind of decide, is this guy really what he says he is? And what's scary for me when I looked into Corey's material is there are aspects of it where it seems like he is trying to place himself as a prophet of sorts, that he is the communication piece between all these different alien civilizations, by the way, that have extremely hokey names. I think like Solar Guardians is one of them. I mean, things that quite honestly grade schoolers could come up with. Um, that have been exposed to anything to do with comic books or science fiction. Uh, and I got a little concerned because a lot of his material seems like it isn't even focused necessarily on that aspect or on discovering more about aliens. He doesn't need to discover it because he knows it all. Um, but him being the mouthpiece for their message and that their message is about making changing this world, um, in many ways making it a better place. So it almost feels to me like this guy read a book on, um, in particular, social media, you know, how to get a good following. There are some pretty known things, you know, be polite, be friendly, try to help your audience, um, and a book or two on enlightenment and kind of fuse those together with this alien story. 
and quite honestly, it seems to be doing pretty well for him. Um, I can see numerous radio interviews that this guy has been on. They have a paywall in front of a bunch of their content, so obviously they have some kind of subscriber base that they're making money off of. Um, but it just left me with so much to question and so much doubt that quite honestly, in my mind, I just consider him a hoaxer. And the truth for me is, I kind of put myself in the Mulder category. I want to believe. I have watched so much material and exposed myself to so many different types of stories about alien contact. Um, and I'm looking for something that I can hold on to and say, yes, now we can prove it. Now we can truly let this belief fly. But I just haven't had that yet. Um, before we continue into the story of Travis Walton, who's probably one of the most well-known alien abduction stories, I have to give a huge thank you to Lisa T. She did a bunch of research on this case. Um, we've been in connection, we've been contacting each other for a while now. Very nice person. She's always been a great supporter of the show. So thank you so much, Lisa. And let's move on to the case of Travis Walton. Oh, and before I go, see that blue avian guy here? Doesn't he remind you a lot of this character from Hellboy? Just add some feathers on the top of his head. You know, if you're going to tell stories about aliens, could we at least have some form of originality about it, please? Anyway, Travis Walton. Now, I have never, ever seen a Wikipedia entry that is set up like this. Look, look at this section up here. This article has multiple issues. Please help improve it or discuss these issues in the talk page. This article may present fringe theories without giving appropriate weight to the mainstream view and explaining the responses to the fringe theories. This article includes a list of references, but its sources remain unclear because it has insufficient inline citations, but also this article relies too much on references to primary sources. Some of this article's listed sources may not be reliable. And of course, I think that is just a good little precursor to what this review is going to be like. There is a lot to take in about this story and then a lot to question about it. But let's get started. Travis Walton, born February 10, 1953, is an American logger who was allegedly abducted by a UFO on November 5, 1975, while working with a logging crew in the Apache Sitgreaves National Forest in Arizona. Walton reappeared after a five-day search. We're going to jump down here a little bit. The case began on Wednesday, November 5th, 1975. Then 22 years old, Walton was employed by Mike Rogers, who had for nine years contracted with the United States Forest Service for various duties. Rogers and Walton were best friends. Walton dated Rogers' sister, Dana, whom he later married. Others on the crew were Ken Peterson, John Goulet, Steve Pierce, Alan Dallas, and Dwayne Smith. They all lived in the town of Snowflake, Arizona. And from what I understand, um, Walton is still there, and so is his buddy, Mike Rogers, but all the other guys have left that area. Um, and there is something, I think, somewhat credible to that. Uh, he has lived in that area his whole life. We're now talking about uh, over 40 years after the fact. Um, and I'm sure he has received a ton of criticism and weird glances and all kinds of odd things from people that are skeptical of his story. Um, but he's stuck around. Discovery in the Woods. Just after 6 p.m. on November 5th, Rogers and his crew finished their work for the day and piled into Rogers' truck for the drive back to Snowflake. The crew reported that shortly after beginning the drive home, they saw a bright yellowish light from behind a hill. They drove closer and said they saw a large golden disc hovering above a clearing and shining brightly. It hovered below the tops of the trees, about 15 feet, over a pile of logging slash. It was around 8 feet high and 20 feet in diameter. Rogers stopped the truck, and Walton leaped out and ran towards the disc. The others said they shouted at Walton to come back, but he continued toward the disc. They noticed Walton stepping backwards. The men in the truck reported that Walton was nearly below the object when the disc began making noises similar to a loud turbine. The disc then began to wobble from side to side, and Walton began to cautiously walk away from the object. Jerome Clark wrote that just after Walton moved away from the disc, the others insisted they saw a beam of blue-green light coming from the disc and strike Walton. 
Clark went on to write that Walton rose a foot in the air, his arms and legs outstretched, and shot back stiffly some 10 feet, 3 meters, all the while caught in the glow of the light. His right shoulder hit the earth and his body sprawled limply over the ground. Now, at this point, I can tell you that the guys in the truck um, were given a lie detector only a matter of days after this occurred. And I actually have a picture here. This is paperwork from the lie detector, and we can see what questions they were asked. It's worth noting that the authorities thought that the guys might have done some foul play here. So you can see the line of questioning. Did you cause Travis Walton any serious physical injury last Wednesday afternoon? Do you know if Travis Walton was physically injured by some other member of your work crew last Wednesday? Do you know if Travis Walton's body was buried or hidden somewhere in that Turkey Springs area? Did you tell the truth about actually seeing a UFO last Wednesday when Travis Walton disappeared? And down here, this is uh, notes from the person, the polygraph examiner here that gave it. Each of the six men answered no to questions one, two, and three, and they each answered yes to question four. The test results were conclusive on Gallette, Smith, Peterson, Rogers, and Pierce. The test results on Dallas were inconclusive. So essentially, five of the six guys passed with flying colors. The sixth guy, it's inconclusive, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he was lying. It could be that he had some type of physical physiological reaction that skewed the results for him, so they couldn't deem those results conclusive. Um, so, at least from the perspective of the guys in the truck, what they saw was an unidentified flying object. They didn't know what it was, and um, we can know that that part of the story holds up and remains true. Now, what happened to Walton after that? Let's take a look. Um, apparently, he woke up in a ship of some kind, and we're going to pick up this story at HuffingtonPost.com. This is an article they just released last year to coincide with a new documentary being released about Travis. Here's a picture of Travis Walton right here. When I was first able to focus my eyes good enough, I was still on the table, and as soon as I saw his, this face, and I knew it wasn't human, I tried to hit it away from me. They were much smaller than me, and I think that's the reason they gave up. Once they found out they couldn't control me, they split. I was absolutely terrified. So just to give you more detail, um, and you can search YouTube and find tons and tons of information about this. Travis speaks about this a lot. Uh, he goes to a lot of different conferences and events to cover this. Uh, you might also be able to find certain television shows that have covered this. I even found one that did some recreations where they literally showed footage of this guy, you know, inside a spaceship going through all this. But the rest of Travis's story kind of goes like this. He's on this hospital table. He wakes up. He sees these strange creatures. Uh, yes, large eyes wearing some reddish or orange type of jumpsuit. Um, I believe there's two or three of them in the room with him. He kind of pushes them away. He stands up off the table, backs up into something else that's in the room and grabs an object. And in one particular interview, he says that this object was almost like some type of glass tube and that he tried to strike it to break the end off to make a sharp point, but it wouldn't break. In other interviews I've seen with him, he doesn't mention uh, any details about what the object is, just that he wasn't sure what it was, but he grabbed it and he swung it a few times and that seemed to uh, make the aliens react where they put their hands up and then they exited the room. Uh, not put their hands up like this, but put, put their hands up like, like forward and then exited the room. At that point, Travis exited the room. These rooms don't have doors. He went into some type of hallway. He described it as circular. Um, he found another opening, went through the opening, and it sounds like he's in some type of possibly a control room, but this or some type of uh, piloting area. But this is where the story has a little bit of minor deviation when he tells it. Um, in one case, he talks about there. In every case, there's a seat in the middle. But in one case, he talks about seeing a screen of some kind that had uh, almost like green lines through it, and then there was little uh, hash marks that were on those lines. And as he pressed buttons that were on some type of console next to the seat, those hash marks would move, but he didn't know what they were doing. Um, 
in a recreation that I saw that was based on an interview with him, um, they made it look like he hit a button and he was seeing a, a star field and that the star field would move around. I don't know, um, based on all of his interviews that I've reviewed, I don't know if that was accurate. I don't know if they did that just for the recreation. Um, but according to his other interviews, that one, that piece doesn't really hold up for me. What is striking to me is as opposed to Corey Good, um, the guy I was mentioning at the start of this video, when you watch Travis Walton speak about this instance, you don't get a funny feeling that he might be lying. At least I don't. Um, the detail that he gives seems to be appropriate with the type of mental state that you would be in if you were going through something like that. You might remember how the air felt. You might remember an object that you grabbed and how it felt in your hand. Um, the lines and the hash marks. I mean, you, you might remember specific details like that. Um, Corey's stuff is written almost like it, it starts going third person and it's just, it's completely unbelievable to me. But Travis's story very much is told from the first person. And when I first started looking into this case based off the info Lisa sent me, I found an interview with Travis that is supposedly his first interview that he gave after he came back from this supposed abduction. Uh, it was a radio interview and I listened to that whole thing. And then I found a very recent interview from him that was only from 2014, I believe November of 2014. And the story lines up extremely well. There is not a lot of variation and I was really listening. I was kind of eagle-eyeing this thing because I wanted to see, okay, where's the discrepancies? If this guy's lying, you know, 40 years later, you're telling the same story. You're probably going to exaggerate some parts of it or make it a little more fantastic or something like that. It almost beat for beat uh, came across very much the same as the first time he told it. So in my eyes, that kind of gave it more credit for me as I was looking into this. Um, and since watching those two, the earliest and a late interview, I've watched several others that were taken at different periods within that time frame. And each time he describes it, it's pretty much the same story. It's really, if he is lying about it, it's really impressive to me that he's keeping those details in such fine order and able to recall them time and time again like that. That being said, if he's made a career out of this and he's talking about these things at events and radio interviews and he's written a book about it, there was a movie called Fire in the Sky that was made off the book. I have intentionally stopped myself from watching that movie because I didn't want it to taint this episode of Brain Scratch, but I am going to watch it and I'll, I'll be sure to do a Geek and Dorks review on it soon. Um, it just impresses me that this story stays as stagnant almost um, as, as it does. Um, but back to the story, it's not done yet. Um, he, while he's in this cockpit room, um, all of a sudden someone appears in the doorway and this does appear to be a human to him. But the person is wearing a helmet and he starts trying to communicate with this person but the person isn't communicating back. Um, the person leads him out of the room. And now, at this point, he takes him to a ramp and Travis very, has a very good recollection of this ramp and that it's extremely steep and he's worried that he's gonna slip as he's walking down it. He also doesn't feel great because uh, supposedly of this blast that has happened to him, he's assuming. Um, but he goes down this ramp and then he is in what sounds like a, a, a hangar of some kind. He notices a few other crafts uh, of similar types in the same hangar. Um, there's one wall that he describes as almost looking like glass, but if there was sunlight just blasting through it, but you can't see an actual sun, it's just light, the whole thing is lit up. Um, and then this person, this human, takes him into a room where there are other humans that don't have helmets on. Once again, he's asking them what's going on, he's asking for help, and no one is really responding to him. They lay him on a table, they put a mask on him, and he goes out. The next thing he knows, he's waking up on a highway. He looks up and he sees the UFO in the sky just for a moment as it's disappearing. And he goes to a local call box and phones, um, I believe it's his brother-in-law, asking to be picked up. And at that point, um, we find out that it's five days later. 
and his memories only seemed to account for about two hours of this five-day stretch that he was on. So at this point, the story really starts going all kinds of different places, particularly if you are uh, looking into the more skeptical angle of it. Around that time, the National Enquirer, which out here in America is a, I don't know if it still is, but it once was a very famous tabloid, um, huge in the 80s. And they had a standing, a standing deal out there that if anyone could prove that aliens existed, they would give them $100,000. And quite honestly, that's one thing that people are skeptical about. They think that Travis might have concocted this whole ordeal in order to cash in somewhat on, on that. Um, so the National Enquirer is dispatched, um, CBS sends 60 Minutes out, and on top of that you have all these different UFO organizations that are just descending on the scene, bringing their own experts, um, all kinds of different doctors, and they're doing all these different tests. Um, he does give a urinalysis. They do test that for any types of narcotics. Apparently he is clean. Um, one of the theories is from the skeptics is that he went on a some type of drug drinking binge for five days and then showed up five days later. Um, I really don't know how much stock I put into that aspect or that story. Uh, I think if he was going to pull off a hoax like this, he would likely have figured out some type of safe location he could go to um, and probably stay away from that, knowing that he would go be going through tests when he came back home. But regardless, no results were found that support um, that type of theory. Um, but now you start having all these reporters on scene and their stories start, they start kind of becoming a part of this lore in, in their own. Here at debunker.com there is a Travis Walton page. Of course, this will be in the links uh, in the description box below so you can check this out for yourself. And Jeff Wells was actually an employee for the National Enquirer that was sent to the location. So um, I highly recommend you check out this account. That being said, both my researcher, Lisa, and also I, uh, before I saw her notes on this, I got this feeling from this account that Jeff was extremely critical and skeptical of this whole situation going into it. And he, it feels to me like um, he's looking for information to only support his viewpoint that he already had coming into this. It doesn't feel very objective to me. That being said, he talks about certain events and certain facts that are probably worth reviewing if you are really interested in looking at that skeptical viewpoint. Um, what else is also great about this page is we have some pictures here of the National Enquirer article. And it's curious to know, according to Jeff's account, he basically sent in a memo detailing all his experience that had happened here, and he thought that that would be killing the story with the National Enquirer, and instead they took his memo and kind of did a hack job on it, and they turned it into the official story that they released on this case. Um, so this is a page from it here, Five Witnesses Passed Lie Test While Claiming Arizona Man Captured by UFO. Here we can also see a picture of Travis and the other guys and it's calling them award winners here. Um, shows off a check for $2,500. The six others who saw the incident share $2,500. So not quite the $100,000 payday I was mentioning early, but obviously it does seem like there was some financial incentive here. Um, another theory that has kicked around was that the contract that they were working on for the National Forest Service um, had some stipulations in it about how much work they had to get done for them to be paid. And that's why they were working uh, as late as they were that day. And it's, there's a theory that Mike Rogers and Travis might have concocted this whole idea because an act of God that stopped the work from happening would be a reasonable excuse for them not being done in time. Um, so that's just another theory that's kind of floating out there. Uh, also on Debunker, down near the bottom, there's this uh, info under this Carl Flock comments on Travis Walton case section that I wanted to go over with you real quick. This is um, testimony that was obtained from witness Steve Pierce, one of the workers, during a June 20th, 1978 tape-recorded telephone interview. Um, Klaus asks, what did you see? And Pierce says, uh, well, 
I thought it was something a deer hunter, you know, rigged up, you know, because it was deer season, you know, so he could, you know, and, uh, but I couldn't see the bottom or a top or sides. All I could see was the front of it, you know, you couldn't tell if it had a bottom to it or, you know, or a back or anything. And the author of this piece is now theorizing, hmm, a plan nine from outer space saucer, perhaps. Um, I think what they're talking about is, I believe some hunters, when they go out hunting a um, game like that, will build an elevated platform that they will sit up in, kind of like a crow's nest, and they will hunt from there. And according to this testimony, this guy thinks that maybe it is some type of platform like that that's been rigged up. Maybe there's been some lights put on it of some kind. Um, another little piece of info that just scratches my brain a little bit. This is actually from TravisWalton.com. This is Travis's own words. This is a piece from his book. And um, it's just getting to the point where the guys see the UFO. From the driver's seat, Mike could not look up with the proper angle without leaning way over. What do you guys see? He demanded curiously. Dwayne answered, I don't know, but it looked like a crashed plane hanging in a tree. So it sounds to me, now we're getting a bit of a better idea of, first of all, their view seems limited because of the cabin of the truck. But outside of that, even the guys that can see, one of them thinks that it is a crow's nest or a hunting perch. The other thinks it's something hanging out of a tree. So that is leading me to believe that they did not have a good enough sight of it being independent of the trees, being a true open clear area where they could say, no, that thing's hanging in the sky. There's nothing supporting it from below. There's nothing supporting it from above. We now have two pieces of evidence from two different guys here that it could be something that was propped up somehow. Now, this makes me think about a video I bumped into only a few weeks ago called the McPherson tape. And uh, the McPherson tape came out in the 1980s, and it is pretty much kind of an early form of the Blair Witch Project. It is a found footage type piece of entertainment, but I don't believe it was released as entertainment originally. Um, I think it was originally created as a hoax item by a movie production company who later admitted to it. Um, but it looks like a family that is celebrating a birthday party they have some weird experiences. They go out into the woods and they come across an alien ship. And I've watched the footage myself. And yep, you can see there's a ship out there. It's all lit up and there's aliens walking around it. Um, and then it goes on to almost a bit of like a horror movie thing where the aliens keep coming to the house and messing with the house. Um, honestly, you should check it out for yourself if, if you're interested in found footage um, or art of that kind at all. But do know that even despite the fact that it has come out as being a fraud, I still see people talking about it like they're not sure if it's true or not. You can literally go and find the credits for the actors and find out that their names don't match up the names that they're saying they are in this footage. Uh, and not only that, you've got producers that have talked about it, directors that have talked about it. Even the budget of that film is known. And that's the point I wanted to raise it cost them about $5,000 to produce that found footage movie. And I'm pretty sure a big chunk of that money went towards the actual creation of the UFO saucer and then the costumes for the aliens. Um, guys that are working, these are laborers, they're loggers, they're working 12 hour days at this point. When are they gonna fabricate something that can be passed off as a UFO? Where are they going to have the funds to pull together whatever is needed to do that. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible, I just think the likelihood of it, in my mind, is somewhat low. And then you have to ask yourself, um, after Travis went missing and the guys got back to town, they contacted authorities and authorities went back out with a few of the loggers and searched the area for Travis. So whatever, if it is something that's built, it had to be something that was collapsible and movable. Some, some way people had to be able to get rid of it um, because it wasn't there when they went back and searched the area, the area thoroughly. And keep in mind, this is a guy that was missing for five days, so we're probably talking multiple searches in that area. And of course, this item, this big spaceship, is never found. So on top of thinking about the money that someone could potentially make for saying that they had witnessed some type of alien or spacecraft. 
Um, I bumped into an interesting wrinkle in, in this story where money was offered to say that it was a hoax. This is on badufos.blogspot.com. It's talking about um, Philip J. Klaus, who is a big um, critic of this whole experience. On a website promoting the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina as a UFO hotspot, Sky Ships Over Cashiers. There is a page titled Debunker's $10,000 Bribe to Stop UFO Truth. This claim now making the rounds of UFO-related forums. Someone shouts out on the Outpost Forum on February 5th, Bribe Bombshell. Steve Pierce, who was with Travis Walton when he was abducted, claims that he was offered a $10,000 bribe from the late debunker Phil Class to state that the entire Travis Walton alien abduction claim was a hoax. Travis Walton himself quickly replied, yes, it is true. I even mentioned this in the 1996 edition of my book. So very interesting to me that people are offering money on both sides of this. And if anything, it seems that everyone is clamoring for fame of some kind, either fame for, yes, I was involved in an alien abduction um, or fame for, I can prove that this didn't really happen. One last piece I wanted to go over in terms of skeptics. Sheriff's nephew claims Travis Walton hoax well known. And uh, I'm not going to read through this whole thing. <laughs> Just to give you a little flavor from it though. Okay, all of you alien freaks. I hate to ruin your dreams, but here is the truth about Travis Walton. Um, this kid is uh, supposedly a classmate of one of Travis's children. And uh, also related to the sheriffs that conducted the original work around this case. Here's a section I do want to share with you, and here's my proof about the whole thing. When my uncle Sank was retired, he told my uncles and my dad that they knew Travis was in Concho after the fact, but there was a lot of manpower spent on trying to find him for the week he was gone, and there was a lot of money being brought into the community by the whole ordeal, so they just let it be. Now this kid thinks that Travis was hanging out with a another one of the loggers who happened to have a drug problem, I think. And um, this kid definitely takes the stance of, hey, this is just a druggie, we shouldn't believe anything, he says. Um, like I said, they do have uh, test results from a urinalysis and it doesn't look like any illegal narcotics were found. Um, so I don't know that that's true about Travis. Uh, that doesn't say that maybe he wasn't being hidden um, somewhere, but I don't think it was with one of the loggers. I think that information would have shook out far too easily and they probably wouldn't have passed the lie detector test about the UFO if they knew that there was some type of hoax going on there. Um, that being said, I did see another theory by a skeptic thinking that Mike Rogers might be in on this ordeal and that if he and Travis had coordinated this together, the other five guys would not have needed to know about it. And when you consider the positioning of Mike Rogers being the driver of the truck, Travis being the person going to engage the hoax, um, and then Mike having the ability to control how much the guys see by driving away when he thought it was appropriate, um, that there might be some credence to that theory. Now, the big question I've been kind of avoiding as we go through this whole case is what about a lie detector test on Travis Walton himself? And I can tell you after doing a little digging, I found information on this. And his first lie detector test, he failed. Now there's some controversy around that. Some people say that the equipment that was being used was horribly out of date, that the equipment was more than 30 years <laughs> out of date. Um, the person giving the test was not doing his job properly. Um, Travis then took two more lie detector tests that he passed, but there is controversy around that as well. Um, the main controversy being that Travis was dictating the questions that would be asked specifically. And um, that is apparently a no-no in, in doing polygraph tests because uh, people can kind of steer the question towards their answer that they could say is truthful, but the question could be interpreted a few different ways. So that's where I leave it with you, brain scratchers. I don't know really where to take this, um, but my mind keeps going back to those multiple interviews that I listened to, to those details coming out being largely the same from interview to interview to interview, and looking at that occurring over the, co the course of 40 years, over 40 years now. Um, 
That being said, this could be a career of living on a lie. This man might, has made significant amounts of money, I'm sure, between his book and the movie rights being sold. Um, and I really, I don't know. I'm at this point where I am back to absolute square one. But uh, as far as I know, this is one of the most famous cases of an alien abduction and often considered one of the most viable in terms of it being true because you have the accounts of all these other men um, and those polygraph results that stand about what they thought they experienced. So I think where I have to leave it is something weird happened in the woods that night. A bunch of them didn't know what it was, but Travis, I don't know. He might have known exactly what was going on. Well, tell me about it, Brain Scratchers. Do you know more about this case? Have some other details you want to share with the rest of us? Please drop it in the comments below. Feel free to include links. I'll be sure to let them through the spam filter as soon as I can. And I hope you're all having a great day. Thank you so much for joining me on this edition of Brain Scratch, and I'll catch you on the next show on the Geek and Dorks channel. Take care.